specifically talk about the commoditization of labor. You know, we have this interesting situation nowadays where wage to, to a lesser extent salary labor remain the predominant ways of organizing work almost everywhere in the world at this point. But historically, if you look at the sort of broad historical sweep, you know, while such arrangements often existed in, 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 in many perhaps most times and places, they were kind of unusual, even considered anomalous in most. Um, and you know, while there has been a lot of very good research on the history of such labor arrangements, um, it's actually really uncommon to see anyone put the pieces together in a any sort of broad synthetic way. Um, I mean, you often see books on different forms of labor in a certain region, or labor in the Indian Ocean, labor in medieval northern Europe, but it's surprising how, how rarely they, they make that many general points. Um, so I, I thought I would start um, by taking up some of the ideas about commoditization of labor that kind of came on me when I was pursuing the work on debt. And, and thus, I want to start with talking about bride wealth and bride price in that debate. And what I thought were one of the more, um, what I thought was one of the cooler points that I kind of came up with while I was researching debt, which is an intervention in an anthropological debate about the nature of bride wealth and dowry, um, and about um, the sort of power of debt to transform uh, one into the other, transform what are essentially social uh, social currencies uh, that are used when social currencies turn into commercial currencies. You know uh, what are sort of social arrangements can turn it become commoditized in ways that um, must turn them into the opposite of what they had previously been. But to go from there, and that's largely about um, the commoditization of women's labor through much of history, through marriage systems, to talking about wage labor itself. Um, so there's three parts. Um, there's that, uh, going for the role of debt in sort of dislodging labor from the sort of social nexus in which it is, uh, has been placed, it, seen from the perspective of marriage systems, but then seen from the perspective of, of wage labor itself, which has a very, very interesting history and, and, and in many times and places, probably most, seems to emerge above all from within institutions of slavery. And then finally, to look at a case where wage labor actually didn't emerge from within institutions of slavery um, in Northern Europe, and particularly England. Um, and in that case, to look at the role of debt in redefining English agricultural, industrial, and commercial workers, not as creditors, but essentially as, as debtors to those that they worked for. Now, let me start at the beginning. Um, so part one is bride wealth dowry and just plain bride price. Um, one of the less remarked arguments in debt, um, although as I say, one of perhaps one of its more ambitious interventions in anthropological theory, I don't think anybody noticed because it's largely in the footnotes, um, <laughs> was a critique of Jack Goody's famous argument of the opposition between bride wealth and dowry. Um, I mean, I, I would see it as much as an expansion and slight modification of, of Goody's argument rather than um, a contra in contradiction to it. I'm, I'm pretty sure Goody would see it as in contradiction with it. In fact, when people raised some more points, he, he argued against them. Um, so I seem to be on the other side. Go Goody's core argument, I think, everyone has come to accept, uh, which is about the distinction between bride wealth and dowry. Um, and that actually, the whole anthropological debate on the subject can actually be traced back to a political question. In the 1930s, the League of Nations was holding a series of debates about whether the practice of what was then called bride price should be banned as a form of slavery. Or, you know, is, does bride price actually mean people are selling women? As one might imagine, anthropologists were sort of called in as expert witnesses, testified, and Evans Pritchard in particular entered the argument to make a strong case that even in societies where people actually say things like, yes, I am buying a wife, they don't really mean it. Uh, th such statements are not to be taken literally because even if payments only move in one direction, as they ought, as they didn't necessarily, you know, there's some places there's actually payments in both directions. Um, the important thing is that things are moving around, but that would be the case often in Southeast Asia and Africa. It was often one uh, things moved just one way from the um, 
wife takers to the wife uh, wife givers. You know, even so, he argued, there's no sense of payment, and and there were a number of criteria that were listed as why this does not resemble a payment. This that if you were to buy, say, a cow, um, one was um, that both parties continue to have mutual rights and responsibilities, um, and so did their lineages and clans. Um, another was that if anything was actually being purchased in the case of, of bride wealth, and this is the period where they actually insisted that we get rid of the word bride price entirely and substitute bride wealth, if anything was really being purchased, the argument was it was not the woman but her fertility, more specifically the right of the wife taker's lineage or clan to name any children of the union as, as their patrilineal descendants. So in that sense, women no way resemble the slaves, since slaves are by definition entirely detached from their natal web of social relations, whether by capture or purchase, and of course they don't have any rights but only responsibilities. Um, and finally, this is really the clinching argument um, for a lot of people. Uh, you know, if you're really buying a wife, then you could sell them, right? Um, and in fact, there's pretty much no case in which someone who obtains uh, a wife by bride wealth can then just sort of arbitrarily pass her on to others uh, for a similar payment. Now, as a result, this, you know, bride wealth payments were not banned. Anthropologists basically won the argument. Um, the assumption was that bride wealth was not buying wife or an exchange of gifts meant to create social relations or to transform them to establish or renew an alliance between two different groups. Now, Goody's work on production and reproduction, bride wealth and dowry, kind of takes off from that. And in particular, um, Goody was fascinated in particular by the anomaly of Ethiopia. Uh, the fact that you know, when you talk about African systems of kinship and marriage, um, Ethiopia seems to be the one place where almost all the rules that make Africa different than Eurasia don't apply. So, you know, instead of bride wealth, um, they do dowry and um, they have plow agriculture instead of hoe agriculture. There's not there are any number of different ones uh, I could go into having to do with cuisine and everything else. Uh, but his big point was that it all has to do with technology and population de density. It's actually interesting, it's a purely materialist argument at root, which has been widely accepted even amongst um, anthropologists who generally don't go for that kind of thing. Uh, what he basically says is uh, that where you have hoe agriculture rather than plow agriculture, you have low population densities, you don't need um, heavy duty technologies to produce to produce crops, and therefore it's, it's, it's not land but labor that's at a premium. Bride wealth seems to correspond to those societies, and, and bride wealth, it's not the fact that one is transferring a property in order, you know, to the wife takers in order to gain a woman. I mean, that is, that does happen, he says, uh, but actually, you know, payments can move back and forth in different directions for different reasons. It sets up a nexus, uh, but it's mainly about the allocation of labor. And it's the key thing for him is that bride wealth is passed back and forth by the generation above um, the couple that's getting married. So it's actually the lineages or the descent groups, clans, whatever they might be, that they're part of who are rearranging things together because in such a situation where land is real, um, easy to come by and where women are doing most of the agricultural work or uh, either a lion's share of it or all of it as, as they are in, in many African societies, uh, female labor is really important and, um, you know, clans basically have a range of options starting from trying to keep their daughters uh, around, uh, which is the matrilineal option. In fact, in, in such societies where you don't have a bride, bride wealth custom, you tend to have matrilineal, um, to ones where there's various forms of bride service, and finally, um, flat out bride wealth, and polygyny where you're trying to basically ac accumulate as many women as possible for your own clan. Um, so essentially, these are, are, are arrangements made between the elders um, of various descent groups about the allocation of women's agricultural labor, he argues. Now, dowry is completely different because, you know, it's not just a reverse that dowry, it's, um, it's, it's the women's family that's providing the wealth. Again, sometimes that's not even the case. What's really going on with dowry, he says, is that 
Bowery's premature inheritance. Now, when you have plow agriculture, that's usually with very high population densities. Uh, land is at a premium, and there's various strategies to bring land together. Thus, while Bridewell societies tend to be exogamous, uh, dowry societies tend to be endogamous. Um, you tend to marry within the group. You tend to try to um, form marriage alliances, which will keep property together. And women, um, the are not nearly as important as the dominant labor force in agricul agriculture, um, which means that in many ways they're seen more as a mouth to feed, he argues, than as you know the, the core of your agricultural labor force. So, so as a result, daughters are typically had to be provided with some kind of resources when married off, either land of their own or something else that would take the burden of supporting her away, away from the husband's family. Um, all right. Now, there are a lot of cases which are kind of intermediary. I actually w was in a society like that when I did my own field work in Madagascar, for example. Um, they had both bride wealth and dowry. In fact, it came from the same thing. A husband's parents would pay a sum of money. It's called the Vudi Undri, or rump of a sheep, but actually it was a sum of money, uh, to the bride's family. And then the bride's parents would then immediately use that money to buy furniture, bedding, pots and pans, and other necessities for the new household, which they would then give to the bride. Um, or goody, this would just be a form of indirect dowry. Um, the point is that the money ends up in a conjugal fund for the newly married couple. So anyway, that's the broad, uh, broad argument, which, you know, since this isn't an audience of anthropologists, I thought I'd go over it. I can't assume that people know the details. Now, in, in where the argument hits the shoals, I think, is in its treatment of social class, or really its non-treatment of social class. Stanley Tambaya, who co-wrote one of the key original texts, Bride, Wealth, and Dowry with Goody, in 1973, um, very soon began to raise objections to certain aspects of this based on his own detailed knowledge of, of the South Asian ethnography, where he pointed out that um, there's a lot of urban societies in Eurasia or, or or rural societies which are part of large urban civilizations where you know you have dowry at the top of the social ladder and, and something that looks a lot like bride wealth on the bottom. As he points out, the um, you know the sort of magnificent seclusion of upper caste women in India who have often had to be provided with astronomical dowries to keep them you know, kept in the style to which they were accustomed was only made possible by the industrious labor of lower caste women who necessarily had to have completely different marriage arrangements. And there's a quote, quote from Tambaya. It should be appreciated, as Goody failed to do in production and reproduction, that high caste male freedom from menial labor and the conspicuous removal of high caste females from public view are only possible because the system of rural production is predicated on the availability and exploitation of a low caste agricultural labor, both male and female. Moreover, women of these lower orders enjoy much greater freedom of movement outside their homes. Bride wealth rather than dowry payments are exacted on their marriages, thus ac accenting the greater economic value of their labor and divorce, separation, and remarriage, including remarriage of widows, is frequently open to them. So, you know, 